Good evening, everybody. This is Dave Roundtree, and uh, tonight uh, we're going to talk a little bit about episode four. Um, technical wise, Holmesburg Prison presented a lot of issues. Number one, there was no power anywhere inside of the investigation area for us to utilize to run any kind of equipment, including cameras, lighting, uh, or the actual power required to do the experiments. Um, what you didn't see <laughs> during the daytime investigation, which none of the daytime investigations was, was, was actually put uh, into the show, um, but I actually spent uh, two and a half hours setting up the experiment in the location alone. Uh, Holmesburg Prison uh, rates right up at number one for creep factor for a location for me, and this is after 38 years of doing research in some of the craziest places on the planet. <clears throat> um, I will say that while I was setting up the experiment, I had several personal experiences, um, some of which uh, were very disturbing. Uh, I was touched several times, I was shoved twice, uh, I had a lot of uh, things go wrong with the equipment trying to set it up. Um, the primary uh, scope of the experiment initially was to try to get some type of background information uh, on the location during daylight hours, which I could then use as a sort of baseline. Um, however, once we fired it up, we had a very elevated level of EMF, and uh, using portable equipment, I could not locate the source of that EMF. Uh, it looked like it was emanating from an area about two, front, two feet in front of the opening to uh, H block or the block that we ended up uh, doing most of the nighttime investigation and because of the reported activity there and because of the murder that took place and we sort of centered it around the location where the inmate fell and died on his way out. Uh, that also seemed to be the location of where the EMF was emanating during the daytime. And of course you saw part of the daytime experiment where we were actually getting responses to the waveforms by going out and stimulating the environment with ourselves. Um, what you didn't see was John go out and do it and what you didn't see was me actually go out and pretend to be a prison guard since at one time in my life I was actually a correctional officer many years ago. So it wasn't much of a, an act for me to do. Um, all of us got some response. Chad got the best response. Uh, therefore, Chad uh, Chad segment was included in the episode. Um, also, what you didn't see was a complete tear down of the monitoring equipment and relocating it and extending the cabling all the way out to where the RV was outside of the facility. Um, this allowed uh, the monitoring, the remote monitoring of the facility, overnight. What you also didn't see was the use of the Tesla coil. The Tesla coil was fired several times during the course of the investigation and uh, it was quite interesting watching that come across the EMF quadrilator because it was very easy to determine the exact location of where the Tesla coil was. It was dead center in the middle of the test field uh, and it showed as being dead center in the middle of the test field. So you didn't see that. Um, the first night I did not stay the full night. I left the site at about 1.30 in the morning. Uh, however, because of the situation, uh, you know, with Chad and, and everything, I, I was asked to come in for the second night. Uh, I came in for the second night and stayed the entire evening. Now that was the evening that John was doing his solo investigation. Now the three of us were very close. Um, we had a lot of safety uh, systems that were used in this investigation because it was such a large facility, but we used these safety situations and protocols at every location. Um, John had his panic button. It was thoroughly tested several times from different locations in the prison. It worked fine. Uh, during John's investigation, the EMF went off scale inside of the facility. Uh, literally, I had my sensitivity cranked all the way down, and we had at one point four Gauss, not milligauss, four Gauss. That's four 
thousand milligauss of EMF inside of that facility. Um, systems failed all night long. Uh, cameras failed. Batteries went dead. Um, other things that occurred, lighting failed. John's walkie-talkie, which was a backup emergency uh, situation, did not work. His panic button did not work. We thought we came very close to losing John in this episode, and it took him quite a while to get stabilized from uh, the effect that the site had on him. Um, now, also, what you didn't see was at the end in the wrap-up, uh, all three of us sat on the uh, platform in front of the Terror Dome, and we discussed what actually was occurring in the Terror Dome uh, as far as what I felt was the cause of our elevated level of EMF and to me the dome itself acted like a parabolic reflector and I believe any energy that was inside of there was being amplified uh, 18 to 20 dB above its normal level and it created an energy feedback in which that energy just kept slowly building as the course of the evening went on. Um, I have never in the seven years or so that I've been using different versions of the quadrilator, uh, encountered EMF that intense, particularly in an area where there was no power. Now, once again, 60 hertz, which is residential and industrial power frequency, was pulled out of the mix. I used notch filters to completely remove that from what we were displaying and what we were looking at. So, none of that could be attributed to any kind of residential or industrial power. Uh, aside from the fact that there was none, uh, none of the systems were powered up in there. There was a couple of lights that were like, there was one light at one end of the entryway uh, that you can, I think, see in one of the uh, camera shots. That was it. Everything else was pitch dark. Um, and, and that light wasn't in the area of investigation. It was further down the hall near the entryway. Um, and I don't know if that was on all the time because it was controllable by a switch. Um, everywhere else, it was pitch dark in there. And uh, if you don't think that place was creepy, it was. All right. Um, second thing, when John was crawling out and Chad could see him finally and hear him, on the check-in camera that the camera was working but the lighting wasn't. Uh, Chad jumped up and ran out to go help John. I jumped up from my location in the bedroom area of the RV where I had my monitoring equipment set up and I sat in front of the camera monitor. Uh, what you didn't see was me looking at the camera monitor and I watched this, this little pale white blob kind of floated along the ground and went underneath of the platform in front of the terror dome. And I was like, what the fuck is that? You know? Um, the editors, when they saw me say that, went back and went through the footage because they wanted to see what I saw. They were flipped out initially as well. But upon frame-by-frame -frame examination, they were able to ascertain that it was a possum. <laughs> a possum had wandered in there. Uh, so that, of course, did not, you know, make the episode because it was debunked. It wasn't really evidence. Um, sometimes I wish they would show the debunking that we do uh, just to demonstrate that we do an incredible amount of debunking before you get what you get in the episode. Uh, and, I, and I tell you that we get a lot more uh, legitimate evidence during an investigation that does not make the final episode simply because there's no time. So what you are getting is the cream of the crop of the investigation, the best parts. Um, but as far as other activity, there was tons of other activity. Um, so this was one of my favorite episodes in a lot of ways, but it was also one of my worst episodes in a lot of ways. Uh, it was my worst episode in the fact that we were really afraid for John. Uh, I mean, I have never, in all the time I've known John, see him come apart at the seams like he did. Uh, the sight affected him dramatically. Uh, everyone who knows John saw a part of John that was alien to them because John never loses his cool. Um, we were genuinely worried for his welfare. Uh, it was the best episode 
and that I had never encountered the intensity of EMF that we encountered at this location. The frequencies were running between zero hertz and roughly about 600 hertz. Um, and it was very obvious when we fired up the Tesla coil because it was a steady overdriving signal in all four sensors. I wish they would have shown that if nothing but just a brief uh, pictograph of it or uh, just a, a, a little shot of it because it would have demonstrated actually the frequency and what we were putting into the room power wise. When the Tesla coil came on, it went off scale. We were putting way more than four gauss of EMF into the uh, environment. Um, so uh, that was a, a very exciting episode. Uh, I think a lot of the fans that were watching it had, uh, had their heart go up into their throat at some point, and I assure you, so did we. Uh, it was kind of interesting that we had a role reversal where Chad was actually rescuing John instead of the other way around and it was Chad calming John down instead of John calming Chad down. I think as the uh, season goes you're gonna see that Chad begins to mature as an investigator and uh, Chad uh, is empathic. I mean he doesn't accept that or really acknowledge that yet but Chad is a very empathic individual and I think that that intensifies his experience when he's alone in these locations. Um, so, uh, that's it for episode four of this week. Uh, as usual, feel free to uh, call me, talk to me, not call me, talk to me or uh, send me a text in, in Twitter or uh, on Facebook. If you have any specific questions, I'll try to answer those. So, um, looking forward to seeing everyone next week on our new night, Thursday night, and uh, have a great week.